Good day. So here we are, second Sunday in Advent. I pray that you've had the opportunity over the last week, at least at the beginning of Advent until today, to ponder and consider the reason for Christmas. And however you, uh, wherever you are, uh, celebrate or I would say better prepare through Advent season, I hope that you will be blessed by it. Thank you so much for inviting me in your places and spaces and look forward to uh, how God will bless us through this message. Cynicism. That's right. Cynicism had found a solid hold on the people. And cynicism led to doubt. They began to doubt God, that he loved them, as he has said, as he had proved over and over, time and time again. And doubting led to disillusionment, and disillusionment began to erode the people's hope in the promises of God. Paul Tripp, in his article titled, Every Other Hope Will Disappoint, postulates this, quote, everyone hopes. Now, if you give that some thought, there's probably not too many days that go by that you or I don't use the word hope in our language, in our speaking. For example, I hope you will be okay. Or I hope the bus is on time. Or I hope the results from my scan are negative. I hope that God heard my prayer and so forth and so on. And Tripp is right when he writes, quote, to be human is to hope. And Tripp goes on to suggest that hope is made up of three things. There's three components of hope. Desire, object, and expectation. Beginning with desire, uh, Tripp suggests that desire fuels hope. For example, the desire to be loved, the desire to be accepted, the desire to be in control, or the desire to be understood. Secondly, Tripp writes, quote, Hope always has an object. Hope always has an object. That is, one looks to something or someone to satisfy their desires. And thirdly, hope carries an expectation. How, when, and where the thing or person in which hope is placed will deliver what is hoped for. It seems to me that Tripp really hit a home run with this. Hit the nail on the head. For truth be told, we often place, you and I place our small and larger desires in the hands of someone or something with the hope that those desires will be met. For indeed, as Tripp suggested, quote, to be human is to hope. So let's turn in our Bibles to Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 and 4. That's where we'll be spending our time with this, this day. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 and 4. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like the fuller's soap, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Verse 4, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former days. Years. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you. Thank you here in this second Sunday of Advent as we look at uh, Malachi, the prophet Malachi, uh, prophesying in the time of the restoration of Jerusalem and the temple. We look to those ancient days and ask you, Holy Spirit, to give us the wisdom and discernment to understand uh, the impact and the message that you have for us today and that we would not only understand it, but we would put it into practice to bring you all the glory you rightly deserve. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we began by hearing of a cynical, doubting, disillusioned, hopeless people. That's how we started today. And now that we have some more information 
up to this point. I wonder if you would have any guesses who these people might be. And if you would say Israel, and if you would say specifically Judah, as we read here in Malachi, of course, you would be bang on. If you remember, if you were with uh, us last week, we learned that through the prophet Jeremiah that Judah and Jerusalem had encountered the judgment of God at the hands of the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar and his armies besieging and eventually destroying the city and the temple and taking many into captivity. We find ourselves here in Malachi, 70 plus years, and the prophet Malachi ministering to Judah post-captivity, post-exile in the city of Jerusalem. We see here in the time of Malachi, the temple is restored, rebuilt. The priesthood is performing their religious services again. And now the master in the empire is the Persians, not the Babylonians. Though they required political loyalty to them, Judah and Jerusalem were free to worship God and live their lives with too much, without too much interference. So then why the cynicism and the doubt? Why the disillusionment and hopelessness? Well, as we began, we need to place the prophet Malachi in history and let's do that. This context is really important to understand. The Malachi the prophet, as we see in, in, the, in the Bible, is the last of the writing prophets. And there's little that we know about Malachi other than what we can uh, garner, that we can draw out of the book of Malachi itself. We do know that Malachi ministered during the time of Nehemiah in Jerusalem and post the ministries of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. And as was already mentioned, the temple had been rebuilt and the people of Israel were back in the promised land. But it seems, as you look at Malachi, that after the initial excitement and joy and enthusiasm of their newfound freedoms, the restoration of the temple and all the religious services there, the people fell back into sin. And this is clearly seen here as we would read through Malachi. We go back to the days of Haggai and Zechariah and their prophecies. And it's through those two prophets that the people of Israel heard the promises of God that the temple would be restored. And, but it would be even greater than it ever was before. The nations from afar would pay tribute and essentially fill the coffers of the temple. That God would do a great work of uh, of revival, a great work of, of his spirit in, in prayer and forgiveness and repentance. And many nations would bow to the Lord and God would be in their midst as well. So why? why? What happened? Well, time passed. The glory of God had not come to the temple, as promised. And some of the heroes of faith... Uh, who served in the restoration and rebuilding and renewal of the temple and religious services had died. So some time has passed, some people had gone. And Pastor John Piper, commenting on this very text, said, uh, quote, the hope that fires a people to be pure and take risks and venture great things with God is fading. And Piper then reminds you and me what affected the people of Israel during Malachi's time can affect us today as the people of God. And he uses us as an example for when he said, quote, just like today, that is you and me, it was not easy for Judah to press on with lively expectant faith when the Lord's coming delays, when the Lord's coming delays year after year. So Judah became cynical, they became doubtful, disillusioned, and their hope took a hit, and, the, and, turn, and they turned their eyes from God. Their hearts were once for God, became passive, and happily at home in the world. For Judah, once full of hope, their desires and expectations placed into the rightful hands of God, now they turned elsewhere. Once God was their Lord, their Savior, their Master, their Father, their Teacher, their everything, now they turned to mammon. In other words, they turned to other gods, such as money and fleshly pleasures. These things became their masters, their teachers, their Lord. 
So God sends Malachi, the messenger of the Lord, and the very first thing that God said to his people, Judah, was this. You look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you. God loves his people, my friends. He wants them to turn back to him to seek forgiveness and repentance, to be restored in right relationship. I have loved you were the first words that came out of Malachi's mouth. You'll also notice as you read through Malachi, a really unique feature that Malachi uses, the Q&A, the question and answer format. This is a unique literary style which, which Malachi uses to call out the sin of Judah. So let's begin that journey as fast as possible this mor- today. I almost said this morning. <laughs> today, chapter 1. We there in chapter 1, we find the priesthood had polluted the offerings of, of God. That's what it says there. That by their actions they despise God above all things. We have a question. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. I, if I am master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests who despise my name. All well, the Bible tells us or teaches us that uh, the way to wisdom is to fear the Lord. They had no fear of the Lord anymore. They went on, more questions, but you say, how have we despised your name? Answer, by offering polluted food upon my altar. Malachi 1.7. You see what they were doing is they weren't being careful in their worship. They weren't being purposeful in their worship. They weren't following the commandments of God as the instructions of the word of God told them. They offered blind and lame and sick animals instead of the unblemished ones as they were commanded. And not only did they pollute the offerings, but they, these priests also, according to Malachi chapter 2, abandoned true instruction and they turned aside from the way. They turned aside from the word of God. And as often when spiritual leaders and, of a community turn away from the word of God, uh, these priests, they had caused many to stumble by their instructions. Malachi chapter 2. So Judas priests and its people had profaned the sanctuary of the Lord. But friends, there was more. In Judas' exchange for the things of God were the things of the world, in their abandonment of the covenant of God, a covenant with God, pardon me, they violated it even further by divorcing and chasing after other women. Aliens, it says in Malachi chapter 2. But there was more. We go to chapter 3, and then we have this anomaly like we did in Jeremiah chapter 33 last week. God, through Malachi, extends mercy and grace again and again. Where we read in Malachi chapter 3, God speaking through Malachi, Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Then we have a question. But you say, how shall we return? Another question, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Another question, how have we robbed you? Malachi 3.8. The answer, in your tithes and contributions. In your tithes and contributions. So Judah and their despondency had come to doubt the promises of God. Their spiritual leaders were no longer faithful and concerned with right instruction. They cause many to stumble. I don't know about you, but if you are a pastor or a leader, an elder, a deacon in the church today, woe on you if you cause your sheep to fall. It is a frightful thing to fall in the hands of God. They cause many to stumble. And maybe this is why some had decided that the grass was greener on the other side and the, and the foreign women were more sexy or more appealing maybe. I don't know. Maybe this is why they cheated in their offerings and tithes and they offered up blind and lame and sick animals and cheated the Lord out of what rightfully was his. See, God had called them to be a holy people, to be set apart from all nations, to seek him first and then he would meet all their needs 
Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all else will be, all else will, and you will receive all that you need. Something like that. I, pardon me, I just lost my train of thought there. But their hope, they were to put their hope in God, but they put their hope in the world around them. Last week, we also talked about how we can understand events like we have here in Malachi. And I recommend it two ways. One, pray. We always must pray when we read the scriptures. For we need the Holy Spirit to teach us, lead us, give us discernment and wisdom to inform us, our minds and our hearts. Two, I suggest that you look for Jesus. Jesus is never far from the text. Apostle John reminds us in John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. You see, the story of humanity is forever linked with Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Apostle Paul said that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. All things were created through him and for him. You'll find that in Colossians chapter 1, 15 and 16. So when we look at chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, we find here the word of God, Jesus Christ. And Malachi the prophet in these four verses speaks of a time that God will send a messenger who will prepare the way for him. Take a look at verse 1, the first half, 1a. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. So the question is, is this the messenger Malachi or someone else? For Malachi indeed, like other faithful prophets, brought the message of the Lord to his people like Nehemiah did, and Haggai, and the others. So looking closer at these four verses, let's put on our biblical thinking caps. We get some idea here. We get some idea here of the character of the, mess- of the messenger that was to come. Verse 2, he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller soap. Now these are not very familiar to us 21st century people. These words for refiner's fire and fuller soap. Verse 3 gives us another clue to help us understand. The messenger God sends will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Now this makes more sense. For you see, when refining gold and silver, a lot of heat is used. A lot of heat is put in in the process, and it's used to burn off the dross. That is the scum, thus purifying the precious metals, gold and silver. And when it comes to fuller soap, Easton uh, Bible Dictionary describes fuller soap as using an alkali base to clean and whiten. But here's the point. The messenger that God will send will you refine and purify his people. Then the refining and purifying work of the messenger, along with the first part of verse 2, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears, would indicate to the reader that Malachi, while a messenger sent by God, is not the messenger of verses 1 to 4. So who is this messenger? I want to say that again. Who are these messengers? Because Malachi here is clearly speaking of two messengers. Let's go back to to Malachi verse 1, verse 1 I mean, A, the first half. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Isaiah the prophet in chapter 40 verse 3 says this, A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah 40 verse 3. So Malachi here, verse 1, essentially is repeating the words of Isaiah 40, verse 3. We fast forward in time to the days of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, we find an encounter in those first 15 verses that Jesus had prepared his disciples to go out into the countryside to preach the gospel. He, He returned to Galilee to teach and preach himself. And his cousin, John the Baptist, who by this time was in jail, heard about this and sent some of his disciples to Jesus to ask him this question. Are you the one who was to come, 
or should we expect someone else? And Jesus sent back a message essentially saying, yes, he was the one. Then Jesus turned to the crowd and he said this about John the Baptist. What did you go out in the desert to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. Then Jesus quoted Malachi 3.1. So who is the messenger of Malachi verse 1? A, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, as Jesus himself said, not only was spoken of by the prophets such as Malachi, but is also the Elijah who was to come. The one that Malachi said would come in Malachi 4 or 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So one down, one to go. Who is the messenger that Malachi points to in verse 1b, the second half? Of the verse. Notice the phrase, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come. This word Lord in your Bible should be in small case letters, capital, then the rest small case letters. It's the Hebrew noun that can mean firm or strong or master or Lord. But keeping with the context, it gives us the way to apply this Hebrew noun. This is the same one that Malachi calls the Lord of hosts, the Lord in capital letters. This is God. God who will suddenly come or come suddenly. Which means, by the way, not immediately, but instantly and unannounced. That is, the messenger of the covenant is coming, but he's not here yet. And when he comes, it will be unexpected. And this messenger of the covenant will be like a refiner's fire, like fuller soap, verse 2. This coming messenger will sit as a refiner and purifier, verse 3, of his people. So then how are we to understand Lord in our text? Well, the Apostle John already filled this in, that Jesus the Messiah is God, in John 1, 1 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. We know that Isaiah prophesied in 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, and his name will be called, amongst many things, Mighty God. So John Piper, Pastor John Piper summarizes all this for us when he, is, when he said, Is Christmas in view in Malachi? The answer is yes. So Malachi, speaking in his time and space and pointing to the unexpected coming of Jesus, the promised Messiah, at the first advent. Now we have to ask the question, very crucial, we're talking about Jesus now, why did Jesus come the first time? Or as Piper put it, the purpose of Christmas. Or as we might say, the reason for the season. Remember what was happening in Judah during Malachi's time? Religious teachers abandoned the word of God and led many astray. The covenant of marriage was under siege. The people's eyes were on worldly things. They saw security in temporary things. So in keeping with Malachi's prophecy, Jesus came to refine and purify a people for himself. Jesus came to break the power of sin and the chains of death by offering himself as a spotless lamb of God. Not the lambs and the rams that... The priests of Judah day were offering up the lame, the broken, the blemished. No, the spotless Lamb of God. And not only was removal of sin in view here, but also the restoration of righteousness. For Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans, chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Well, friends, as we consider Malachi chapter 3, 1 and 4, we ask ourselves these questions. How does this apply, if at all, to our lives today? What are the implications, if any, for you and me in our time and space as followers of Jesus Christ? Well, let's go back to the very beginning of the message and where we talked about hope. All of us hope. It's really part of who we are, our DNA, if you will. And trip described for us the components of hope, desire, object, and expectation. 
And similar to Judah, who once, who once was waiting, hopefully, for the fulfillment of God's promises, who lost hope over time and turned to other places to fulfill their desires. When you consider it's been over 2,000 years since the first advent, we are still waiting for the second advent, the second coming. My question to you is, how are you doing in the hope department? You know, the last 32 months have been a handful, to say the least. There are many difficult challenges we all face right across the world as we move closer to 2023. There are many unknowns, many troubling signs. That's one side of the coin. How about the other side of the same coin? Have you forgotten really comfortable in your places and spaces? I don't mean you, that you are content with your lot. I mean comfortable that, you for, that you've forgotten that you are aliens in this world. If you are a follower of Christ, this is not our home. Piper uses the word goodies to describe worldly goodies. Are you satisfied with the world's goodies? They are kind of shiny and fun, aren't they? I'll give you that much. But here's the thing. Friends, Jesus Christ didn't come so you and I can wrap presents with pretty tidy little bows to stuff our faces with turkey and everything else. He didn't come so that we can have our best life now. He came to die for your sin and my sin for the sin of the world. He took upon himself what you and I deserve. The wrath, the judgment of God. You know that cross that people wear around the neck? It's not some bling to wear around their necks. You can wear it. It's okay. And as awful and as terrible as the cross was, it bears the dear words that our Lord said to Judah in Malachi 1 and 2. I have loved you. So keep this in mind as we journey through Advent. One day, Jesus will come again as he promised, and he will come unexpectedly. And until then, I would recommend to you that we have the same attitude as King David did. And this was his attitude, and I'll leave you with this. Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Let us pray. Oh Lord, that is, that is a wonderful way to end this message. To turn our eyes to you. To renew our pledge to you, Lord. To repent of our sins and turn from the comfortableness of our lives or the Anxiety of our lives as we look around the world today and even in our own families and churches and know that the hope rightly placed with you is where it belongs. And I pray for everyone who is hearing this or watching it or both, God, that you would fill their lives with hope. Not hope of this world and hope of this or hope of that, but hope of Christ this Christmas season. That the peace of Christ would rule in their hearts and minds. O oh Lord, that we, as a people of God, would be on our knees praying for our world, our country, our neighbors. That this Christmas would be a time not only of family and visiting, but of prayer and kindness and generosity and love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless. Shalom.